I'm a neuroscientist and I spend most of my time looking at brain function, but there's something I've realized only recently about my own brain, which is that I'm most creative, most productive, and I come up with brilliant ideas in spaces where I am believed in and affirmed. On the other hand, I've discovered that I'm less effective, borderline idiotic, or what can be sometimes be described as totally stupid in spaces where I'm second guessed and doubted. Spaces where anything good I do is perceived as some stroke of luck or good fortune. Spaces where there seems to be a dark, invisible clock, and I perceive it to be black in color that masks my achievements and belittles my achievements. It paralyzes the way I think, and it stifles my creativity. Some of you have probably experienced this. Have you ever walked into a place and suddenly you feel small? and your confidence shrinks, and you fail to articulate yourself, your brain cells just seem to refuse to cooperate. I've experienced a lot of this, and that's why I've decided to open up this conversation about spaces where we live, spaces where we work, spaces where we're made to feel smaller than we are, less competent than we are, less important than we are. As somebody who spends quite a lot of their time teaching how the brain works, I actually know the anatomy of my brain very well. And I know that it's exactly the same as everyone else's on this planet. I can tell you of structures and cell types and how they intricately carry out their function of coordinating and commanding brain function. I can teach, I can argue, I can explain, and I can conclude on some of the most con complex concepts of brain function. But unfortunately, this incredible three-dimensional brain of mine, beautiful as it is, exists in a two-dimensional world, a world that approaches anyone, no matter how exquisite their brain is, with a fully formed assumption of how their brain is going to work and a predetermined allocation of what dimension it belongs to. This assumption and allocation of dimension is made based on some of the randomest of things, like their skin color, their gender, their sexual orientation, or any other possible isms that you can think of. Now, for me as a young black African woman who is a scientist, I've realized that I sit at the intersection of many of these isms and that I'm not the only one. I represent many others who, like me, their overlapping identity categories mark the beginning of daily struggles and prejudices. A subtle but damaging dose of ambivalent treatments that are conveniently ambiguous, nuanced, and obscured, that sometimes you're not even sure that you're being discriminated against. I feel honored and privileged to be an embodiment of social transformation, the social transformation that everybody is preaching about. I mean, I feel it was a dream to those that preceded me that one day an, a young African woman from the dusty townships would stand at international platforms and contribute to the world of brain sciences. But I must say it has not been an easy walk at all. There are times when people appear shocked to hear that my brain is capable of doing something that is otherwise well within my expected capabilities as a professional. You get people that think your achievements are the result of some stroke of luck. And this seemingly harmless skepticism does not end there. Sometimes it turns into total disbelief that prompts people to check and cross check that it is you and your brain that have done what you have done. I think back to a time that I presented at a conference. I was in the student competition and I gave a brilliant talk, which earned me the first prize. Now in the celebration afterwards, two people approached me to converse with me, I assumed. During the conversation, the one person says to the other one, speaking over me, mind you, she did very well all round, actually. I went and I checked. 
It was not just her catchy talk. Her science too was solid. Wait, what? You went and you checked? Anyway, I smiled and I diplomatically excused myself. Then I went to celebrate my achievement in a dark little corner with a breaking heart. I'd been forced into the other dimension, a dimension full of doubt and disbelief in the capabilities of my brain. The sad thing about the two-dimensional world is that it completely ignores or it is completely oblivious to the stories behind each one of us. It pays no attention at all to our starting points. Some of us started miles behind everybody else. I'm a classical example of having to work very hard to achieve one's dreams and to reach one's goals. And here's my fearless living story. I was born in the heat and the heart of poverty, born to a teenage mother who was uneducated and stayed in the township. At that time, the township we rightly called it a high density suburb. Rightly so, because it is indeed a place where millions of people live in a very short space. The poverty, the hopelessness, the crime rate in the townships. Fast forward to the time I was supposed to go to school. The question of which school I should go to was not so much of an issue. The real issue was, would I go to school in the first place? A whole threat to my existence so early in life. And when I was finally matriculated into the local school, we had to walk plus minus seven kilometers every day, on most days on an empty stomach. School shoes, those were a luxury. School uniforms, packed lunch, school bags, were all the things that our parents could not afford. Thus, we never just dreamt about them. The school itself that I went to didn't have enough classrooms to house all of us. So there was a hot seating arrangement where we alternated between sitting under the trees or using the classroom space that was available. That way, each classroom could be used by two to three classes a day. So we sat under the trees and leant under the trees in cold weather, in rainy weather, in sunny weather, and windy weather alike. But like the absorbent minds that we were, we socked in as much information as we could, even under those circumstances. Reflecting back to this time, I shudder at the realization of how these were not normal circumstances at all. In fact, the same circumstances are the reason why some of the children that I went to school with never made it to high school, never made it to college, or just never made it in life. But I digress. I was saying I started miles behind everybody else. But I was expected to show up at the same finishing line. And my three-dimensional brain rose up to that challenge and to the dream of being a scientist. I'm not ashamed to say I was a brilliant student when I was in school, always in the top 3% of my class, if not the best student in all of my classrooms throughout my educational journey. And in 2018, I graduated beautifully dressed in a scarlet robe with a PhD in neuroscience from one of the best universities on the African continent. But even then, the two-dimensional world is not ready to let me be the free thinker that I've always wanted to be. I still get people that say, no, you can't be a neuroscientist here. Go back to your country or go back to Africa. A certain head of school in an otherwise progressive university where I once worked some time back once called me to their office and point blank asked me when I would be going back to my country. To quote his words, we train people to leave, L-E-A-V-E, -E, and not leave, L-I-V-E. -E. This to me is no different from the struggles that I go through as a young African scientist trying to publish in international journals 
or trying to attend a conference in the global north. Just to attend a conference, I have to provide bank statements, proof of employment, proof of investments in Africa that shows that I've got enough reason to come back. I will not say anything about how young African scientists are asked 101 questions at immigration, or they are sometimes unnecessarily detained at airports. All this because the two-dimensional world we live in relegates what it categorizes as the African brain to the other dimension. The more I think about it, the more I realize that the reason why the African brain has been slow to show up to the world stage in science is not so much of the exclusiveness of the African brain, but the exclusion of the African brain. Now, for me as a woman, regardless of your success story, there seems to be a secret code of antagonism that you just have to deal with and prepare yourself with in any interaction you can think of, be it at work, be it in the society. Some few weeks back, I was sitting in my car when suddenly I had a bang. Someone had reversed straight into my car. While trying to assess the damage and see how we could solve this issue, the person that had bumped into my car turned to me and asked me if I had called my husband so that he could speak to him. I was dumbfounded. I mean, you bumped into my car. The error is yours. The car is mine. So where does my husband fit into this whole story? But he, like many others, just looked at me and thought, well, she's a woman. What does she know? And I was relegated to the other dimension based on my gender. Now, one may say, just find ways of making it regardless, because it's not meant to be a perfect world. It's not an ideal world. Well, fair point. But if only the two-dimensional world would realize how much mental energy is needed to deal with any form of discrimination, but especially with subtle discrimination. If only the two-dimensional world would understand that for most who are like me, young black African scientists, we sit at the intersection of many of these possible isms. And collectively, these seemingly trivial forms of discrimination create an exclusionary and inhibiting environment that forces all of the creative windows in our brains shut and prevents us from contributing meaningfully to the world around us. Now, if there's anything that I realized in my reflection and my consideration of all of this, it's the fact that there's actually nothing wrong with my brain, nothing wrong with my African brain, nothing wrong with my female brain, nothing wrong with my black brain, except the two-dimensional world it exists in, a world that is scarred with centuries of discrimination and exclusion.